Hello, I'm Tracy Grimshaw. Welcome to this special edition of A Current Affair, coming to you from guess where? Hollywood. Tonight we have an Australian television exclusive. She's a businesswoman, a TV star, a host, a producer, an actress, a philanthropist. She's one of the most influential, popular, wealthy women in the world. She is none other than Oprah Winfrey. Oprah, it's great to talk with you. Thank you for your time. How are you feeling? Feeling good. A little laggy, but really exhilarated. Okay, good. I just want to make sure. Because I've done this trip where literally we landed. I had a koala bear on my shoulder within 30 minutes after landing, and he was like clawing into my shoulder, and I was like, I, I don't even know where I am. I guess I am literally in Australia since I have a koala bear, but you can feel a little loopy. For 25 years, she was a daily fixture in homes around the world. I'm Oprah Winfrey. Women and men would switch on for their hourly fix of book clubs and self-help. Special friendship. Why you cheeky bugger? Celebrity secrets. I put the other piece of tape to, but why am I confessing this on that? <laughs> and surprise revelations. Have you ever felt this way? Honest accounts. I have lost 67 pounds. Real struggles and history-making giveaways we will never forget. The Oprah Winfrey Show transformed daytime television and today remains the highest rating talk show in American history. When it ended in 2011, the next step for Oprah Winfrey was even bigger. A television network. Welcome to OWN. Oprah Winfrey Network. And with a solid acting career, boundless philanthropy, and a speaking tour that will bring her to Australia in December. Flow with Oprah Winfrey is busier and as powerful as ever. It, it seems to me, I've followed your career, and it seems to me that you've always been a, a seeker. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've always looked for the answers to the big questions. What does life mean? Why are we here? How mm -hmm. can we be happy? Does the fact that you're now prepared to get up on stage and tell thousands of people that mean that you have the answers? You feel you have the answers now? I feel I have the answers for myself, and I feel that just as over the years, when I would speak to millions of people um, and something would resonate deeply with me, that the fact that it was resonating deeply with me, whether it was from somebody in the audience or some guest I was interviewing, the fact that I would have an aha moment, I knew that mm, at least a million other people are also feeling the same. You know, getting the answer for yourself actually means asking the right questions. And I think for so many people, they never even ask the right questions for themselves. Uh, you know, I say over the years, after the show was one of my best times spending with the audience, and I'd always ask people, so what do you really want? What do you really want? And to a person, they'd always say, I want to be happy. Mm -hmm. But most people could not identify what that, mean, what that looks like. Sure. Mm -hmm. If we look back at your evolution, if you like, and we go back to the beginning, you had a, a challenging childhood. You were born into poverty. You, you suffered sexual abuse as a nine-year-old. Um, you had a pregnancy at the age of 14 and the baby died after a few days. Mm -hmm. Things like that would break a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Why did they not break you? First of all, I had, a, I had a strong sense of being connected to something greater than myself. I call that something God. But I had a strong a spiritual force, and I was very, very, very connected to that. So at no time in my life, when I was in the greatest sense of despair, the only reason I didn't kill myself when I was pregnant, the only reason, and I actually thought about it, and, you know, a couple of times, you know, drank some Tide or... I mean, time to being laundry detergent, uh, ran to, it was doing things to uh, cause myself harm. There was a part of me that always knew that I was going to be okay, that if I could just get through the shame and embarrassment and if my father didn't kill me, um, that, I, that I would be okay. So I have always known this, Trace, that I didn't know what the future held for me, although I thought it would be a good future, but I knew who held the future. And so in spite of 
racial prejudice, bigotry, being born into an apartheid state. You know, my where I was raised in Mississippi in 1954, it was an apartheid state. Sure. Nobody believed you could become anything as a little black girl. My own grandmother didn't believe it. She never thought I was going to do anything other than maybe become a teacher at the colored school. My grandmother's entire life, she was a maid. My mother's entire life, she was a maid. So they didn't have any dreams bigger than being a domestic for me, um, th the daughter. So, but I did. Mm. I did. You, you started in television in the 70s and I started in television in the early 80s so not so very long after. Mm -hmm. It was not a particularly emancipated industry for women. It was terrible. I had the biggest most uh, I think about this sometimes now but I was sexually harassed but I knew that if I did anything about it or said anything about it that I would never work in television again. I had the worst boss I mean, literally, I'm babysitting for my boss, and I'm the anchor on the news. A group of workers staged a demonstration on Capitol Hill this Today, day. nobody could get away with it. But I knew that if I said anything about it, I would have been crushed. I just sensed that the moment is not right. And I saw other people who complained and who did that. And I thought, but I always knew this. I always knew I'm not going to be. There's a, there's a line in an old uh, Negro spiritual that says, trouble don't last always. I always knew that trouble wouldn't last always, that I would not always be in that position. So much so that when I was working for this boss in the town of Baltimore, I never even learned the streets because inside myself I say, trouble's not gonna last always, I'm not gonna be here forever. I'm gonna use this place and this platform to grow into who I need to be and then I'm gonna leave. So you figured you'd have the last laugh? I didn't know if it, I didn't, I didn't think of it as the last laugh, I just knew that I, whatever it was I was putting up with, I wouldn't have to put up with it forever. Hello, everybody. You did things when you started in television that people hadn't done before. You had a confessional style, I think that was how it was described. You would tell everyone about if you were having romantic problems or weight struggles. I would have shot off my thighs years ago. Or life struggles, or you'd tell people about your childhood and it connected you to your audience. Did you know it was going to do that or did it make you feel better to talk about it? Well, I will tell you this, there never was a strategy. There never was a vision for, oh gee, I could, should be this kind of person mm. or that kind of person. In today's market, the, in today's, um, you know, American Idol, Australian Idol, in uh, today's competitive, you know, everybody has to judge everybody for the way you look at it. I would not have been able to make that it. It really is painful. It is because, you know, it is literally, I think, divine timing. You know, all it is is willpower. I mean, I lost five pounds in three days or so. Because I was a chubby little Jerry Carroll no style, I mean, you look back at, I looked, I just saw a tape recently where I'm literally wearing white pantyhose and I'm not a nurse. <laughs> and um, no style, no nothing. I mean, nothing other than my personality and my desire to sit in the chair and ask questions and listen to the answers. The very first time I was on air interviewing some supermodels, and the supermodels were talking about, oh, their thighs and how it goes to get in their cellulite and that. And there's these gorgeous girls. And I felt like a fake sitting there talking to them about that and not saying, well, I can tell you about some cellulite or I can <laughs> tell you what a thigh problem is. I can tell. It felt phony to me to be a part of a discussion where I couldn't participate or was acting like I was just like them. I thought, whoa, what's, what's, what's wrong with this conversation? So the moment where I entered the conversation and said, well, look, let me just tell you about cellulite. I have struggled and struggled and struggled with my weight, so I don't know what you all are talking about. It wasn't because I was trying to, like, have a strategy about anything. It was just like, oh, that was, the mo that was a truthful moment. I had actually interviewed several years before when I was in Baltimore. I interviewed someone who had told me the story of them being abused and I was afraid to say it. I, first of all, the first time I'd ever heard it was on television, that it had happened to someone else. And I was interviewing her and I was probably 22 at the time. 
And this young girl sat there and told the story of her uncle abusing her. And I'm listening to that story and I think, whoa, this is my story. How does she know my story? That same thing happened to me. How does she know that story? But I didn't have the courage to, to say it. So I in, went back with that girl in the green room and I was like, oh my God, the same thing happened to me. And she said, well, why didn't you say it? And I said, I was too afraid. How did you conquer that fear? I said in the beginning of the very first show, I want other people who are watching to know that whatever you're going through, you are not alone.